one of the world's most iconic crops. Entire civilizations have risen on its diminutive stalks. When there's not enough of it and it gets too expensive, kingdoms have fallen. In the 10,000 years since humans started cultivating it, it's been milled, pounded, kneaded, pressed, and baked into a near endless buffet of dishes. Chances are you already marched on something made from it today. We're talking, of course, about wheat. Since its emergence in the Middle East's fertile crescent as one of the first crops planted by people who gave up their hunter-gatherer lifestyles to settle in one place, wheat has been a staple part of humanity's diet. More tender, more tempting, more nice. In Europe, they make baguettes out of it. In South Asia, you can enjoy a delicious roti, shape it into a little blanket, and stuff it with filling, and you've got a dumpling. It's everywhere. That is a lot of capellini. It's pasta mania. We love it so much, in fact, that we call many dishes made from it comfort food. Today, wheat supplies one-fifth of all the calories and protein people consume. It's the most widely grown crop on Earth, covering 217 million hectares of farmland as of 2018, an area bigger than Mexico. Since the 1960s, the amount of wheat harvested worldwide has almost quadrupled, an incredible amount of growth that made food more available than it ever had been before and enabled our population to boom across the planet. But like so many agricultural commodities, as global wheat production exploded over the past 100 years, so did its impact on the planet. We're getting that bread, but it's coming at a cost to the environment. So how bad is it really? To answer, we need to dig down to the roots of the modern food system. For thousands of years before the 20th century, it was hard to get reliably high yields for crops like wheat. Plants need nutrients to grow, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus, but there's only so much of it in the soil. People tried all kinds of ways to make soil more productive for food crops. This is how we discovered manure, which recycles nutrients and livestock feces back into the food system. At one point, people even ground up human bones to sprinkle onto farmland. And in the mid-1800s, when specialists discovered that bird droppings on a few remote South American islands were overflowing with nutrients, it set off a war for control of them. Yes, people fought a war over bird shit. Then, in the early 1900s, everything changed. In one of the biggest moments in modern civilization, two German chemists invented what we call the Haber-Bosch process. They used pressure and heat to combine hydrogen and nitrogen gas, both of which are naturally present in the atmosphere, to synthesize ammonia. Mixing that ammonia with fuel and other oils made it easier to mass produce explosives than ever before. But it could also be processed and turned into a liquid form of nitrogen. After generations of generations of digging through poop and bones to find plant food, suddenly we could snap our fingers and it would literally appear out of thin air. This was a really, really big deal. Almost overnight, synthetic fertilizers created with the Haber-Bosch process changed the world. Harvests of wheat and other food crops shot through the roof, and so did Earth's human population. In 1900, there was 1.6 billion people on the planet. Today, it's more than 8 billion. That leap could never have happened without the amount of food that synthetic fertilizers made available to us. But there was a catch. There's always a catch. And over time, it's turned out to be a big one. The new windfall of nitrogen wasn't all sucked up by the crops we were using to grow with it. A lot of it spilled out into the environment, either by evaporating into the atmosphere or through runoff into groundwater, rivers, and the ocean. Most studies say that anywhere between 65 and 80% of the nitrogen in synthetic fertilizer ends up somewhere it's not supposed to be. Crops like wheat love nitrogen and phosphorus, but unfortunately, so do other plants and microorganisms, some of which are causing really big problems. Have you ever heard of a red tide, where red algae washes up on beaches, or seen a lake covered in an oozy, stinky green film? The word for that is eutrophication, and it's usually a result of too many nutrients in the environment, which breed algae and other tiny species that throw the fragile balance of nature way out of whack. More and more, eutrophication is causing bodies of water downstream from intensively farmed areas to turn into dead zones. These are areas where fertilizer runoff causes the runaway growth of microscopic algae called cyanobacteria, which consume all the oxygen in the water, suffocating anything else that normally lives there. That means no fish, no shrimp, no aquatic life at all. And we aren't just talking about a bad beach or two. Dead zones can be huge. A recurring one in the Gulf of Mexico has covered almost 8,000 square miles a few times in recent years. 
The spillover of nutrients from our agricultural production system is a serious problem across the world. Scientists say that it's one of the areas where we've blown past what they call a planetary boundary, one of the thresholds that we're supposed to stay behind if we want to protect life on Earth. Wheat's not the only crop to blame for this problem. Actually, soy, corn, and others that we use for animal feed are also a major factor, as is really any plant that we use a lot of fertilizer to grow at an industrial scale. But since wheat is such a core part of so many diets worldwide, it's playing a big role. In 2017, a group of scientists looked closely at the environmental impact of producing a single loaf of bread. They analyzed the entire production process, from seed to oven to shelf, and found that the biggest ecological cost came from growing the wheat itself. Not surprisingly, synthetic fertilizer was the main culprit, responsible for nearly half of the damage done by bringing that loaf to market. So it's easier to get a pizza than ever before, but the current system for making the crust is killing sea life and turning fresh water into goop. Sure you want to eat that? Does that mean we're going to have to give up cupcakes and ravioli? So what, no f***ing ziti now? Hey. hey! No, but it does mean that we're probably going to have to change how we produce them. Removing nitrogen and phosphorus from fresh water is extremely difficult. A much better solution is to make fewer nutrients enter the environment in the first place. That means tackling the intensive, yield-focused, but wasteful agricultural systems that we've gotten so reliant on over the past century. Studies showed that if you rotate wheat with other crops that naturally produce nitrogen, like legumes or clover, then you'll need less fertilizer to grow the wheat. Complex computer models can determine precisely when and where to apply fertilizer, so farmers use less of it. There's even talk of using AI to help with that. Different approaches to food production that emphasize nutrient recycling over productivity and profits would help too. Easy to say, right? Harder to do. Moving towards a less ecologically damaging agricultural system will take money, coordination, and above all, the political will to make big changes. Farmers often have tight profit margins, so somebody's going to have to pay to help them shift course, and it could mean others, like fertilizer manufacturers and grain traders, make less money. But the thing is, we don't really have a choice. Unless we want a bunch of dead oceans and lakes that look like slime pits. Dumping fertilizer everywhere might have led to a lot of economic growth, but nothing comes free, and the bill is now due. It's been a great 10,000 year run for us with wheat. It's shaped history and culture, bringing us joys large and small in the process. That's delicious. But if we want another 10,000, we're gonna have to keep the messes we make in our kitchens, not across our planet.